otherwise um we're gonna move forward here we have about an hour um and we'll get through most of the content in about 50 minutes or so and then leave rooms for some questions i will note um i'm in the middle of new york city and you might hear some ambulances or sirens and possibly even my dogs go crazy at some point maybe you'll see them but um otherwise um uh, please ignore those noises and we'll move forward um first a little background my name is jason marticello um i've been with bz since uh it started um i always give a little story on myself to kind of set the stage for how i got into behavioral science and that is that i uh lost over 120 pounds i used to weigh over 300 pounds as a kid growing up and I got super interested and fascinated with how I lost all this weight. You know, if you asked me back then, how'd I lose it? I would have said fitness and nutrition. Um, if you ask me now, my answer is completely different. Even though I have a master's in exercise physiology, I, you know, I had a major revelation at some point that <clears throat> everything um, I learned about uh, fitness, health, nutrition had really little to do with my weight change that massive behavior change to lose that weight and sustain it. It was really more about uh, the field of behavioral science, um, things around such as like how our context influences our choices, the psychology of how and why we make those choices. And all, all, ultimately that motivation that persisted over time to maintain them. Um, so that's when I pivot into the field of behavioral science. Um, and I've been working uh, in the field for almost nearly a decade now, um, and it continually uh, is something that really interests me, not only because it's practical in my everyday life, but also I get to do it every day and help clients, um, which brings me to BZ. Um, BZ is a behavioral science agency. I know there's a lot of clients on here from uh, our existing clients, but for those who do not know who BZ is, BZ is a behavioral science agency. Um, we've been, we started on the ground running with behavioral science about five, four and a half years ago, built from the ground up to incorporate the best of behavioral science um, in a number of different ways. But at, the, at our core focus, we're a behavioral science agency that looks to use behavioral science to drive commercial outcomes for our clients. We're also, uh, you know, we're also just not behavioral science. We're also, you know, focused on consumer insights, marketing strategy. You know, it's kind of a mix and meld of multiple disciplines to ultimately better understand the markets and challenges our clients are dealing with and how we can better drive outcomes for our clients. So, Let's get into today. Today we're gonna, you know, go through three different things. The first is, you know, kind of given an overview and uh, the evolution of decision making. <clears throat> so this will kind of be the sciencey side of things. I'm not gonna go too into detail in some of these things because we're gonna pivot into more of the application. You know, there's a lot of discussion uh, in terms of, you know. Uh, different theories and scientific topics around, you know, behavioral science. But, you know, for all intents and purposes, what we really care about is how we put them into action and to ultimately enhance our research for our clients. And then lastly, we'll just finish with uh, some examples. And uh, hopefully you guys will leave with some interesting ways to uh, think about as well as apply different uh, solutions or techniques to enhance your research. So let's start with the evolution of decision making. Um, you know, this, I think we can trace things back to Adam Smith, who kind of developed this uh, economic or rational choice model in terms of thinking about how we ultimately make decisions. And that's to maximize the benefit of our choices. We're going to go through each of these uh, next. This kind of took a, a bit of a change from Herbert Simon, who developed this, uh, who realized that people don't necessarily maximize decisions. They actually are kind of bounded rational in some sense uh, that these decisions are not perfect. They're not maximizing. Uh, and yeah, we'll discuss some of what he uh, ultimately, how he shaped Adam Smith's original ideas. And then finally, some uh, another 
uh, notorious scientist that many may be familiar with, Daniel Kahneman, who's you know really popularized the field of behavioral science and how that kind of applies in our work today. So let me first give an example, you know, before kind of discussing some of the scientific elements or any of these, uh, you know, prominent scientists who shape the field. You know, the way I like to think about it is in really simple, practical terms. You know, imagine John is gr grocery shopping, looking to buy some mixed greens. How would he make the choice? You know, this is like a decision that, you know, we make hundreds and thousands of decisions like this every day. Um, I just did at dinner uh, last night, you know, contemplating between all the different choices on a menu. The same thing as it goes on a shelf. There's a lot of decisions that need to be made. Do I want uh, arugula, spinach, blah, blah, blah. Like, what, how do I make that decision? What's the healthiest? You know, what, this might be too expensive with inflation. So there's a lot of trade-offs going on that are happening on a very subconscious level that, you know, really, you know, take place instantaneously. You know, the rational choice theory would say that, you know, we identify our objectives, we gather information, evaluate, we compare, we make the choice. I think, as you know, we really don't make, the, this is not how we make decisions. Um, this would take so much processing power and take so much time that, you know, we would just, our minds would just get bogged down, especially as the amount of choice in our environment has, has significantly increased over time. So this gentleman, Herbert Simon, um, who I believe won a Nobel Prize as well as Daniel Kahneman, you know, came up with uh, this concept of satisfying. What he realized is there's three constraints uh, that people have in terms of making you know, good decisions. There's cognitive limitations, we're tired, fatigued, we have you know, uh, limitations in willpower. You know, we have imperfect information. This is certainly the case now and has only accelerated with online. And then we just have time constraints. We're busy, requires time. So this collectively we'll call, you know, bounded rationality. In other words, we're bounded in terms of our ability to make rational decisions. And what the outcome is, is, you know, consumers make satisfying choices or quote unquote, good enough. Then, a, you know, then came along uh, Mr. Daniel Kahneman, Danny Kahneman here, who really appended the um, behavioral science field into where it currently is, um, largely because of his research and then publishing and simplifying some of the thought. Uh, he's mainly a thought leader behind the field in terms of helping make this, you know, very popular amongst um, a lot of the field today. But simply what he did was kind of separate into kind of two uh, very simplistic way of thinking about it. Uh, but it's, you know, there's system one and system two. I, there's a way in which we make complicated decisions and that would be uh, system two, rash, very rationally calculated, collecting information. It's slow, effortful, you know, anything that requires a lot of, you know, processing power. But then there's also what he, recognizes there's a system one or you know kind of that non-conscious very fast autopilot everyday decision making things we do without really thinking about it um, and what a lot of the field would say is a lot of our decision making happens in that system one in other words we are not expending tons of energy making choices on our our uh, on, on a lot of these things we make decisions about, but instead they're calculated and, you know, made automatically with that system one. You know, there's some studies that argue about what percentage. Um, there's certainly a lot of different uh, debates in terms of it. I think in terms of thinking about it, in terms of how our jobs to understand decision making, let's, let's just realize that there's a big opportunity to understand system one in addition to system two. So when we look at, um, you know, going back to that example in terms of, you know, choosing a, you know, a mixed green for our salad here, um, we, we, we're not going to go through that process, that, you know, linear process of identifying objectives, gathering information, evaluating, and then comparing alternatives. But instead, what we're going to do is we're gonna use maybe um, different mental shortcuts or you know, heuristics, um, 
you know, such as like, we'll use the word fresh or the, you know, the green uh, emblem there to symbolize that it's healthy or, you know, we'll see the word express and that means convenient or we'll see a sign that, you know, this yellow tag and see the word free. And, you know, that maybe signals to me implicitly that it's a better value. So we use all these um, different cues in our environment, as well as on the shelf, as well as on the package to implicitly communicate to us, um, is this what I need? Is this gonna, you know, get to my objective? And remember that objective is not necessarily, I want the, you know, the bet, you know, the cheapest or the healthiest, but, you know, you're satisficing based on that criteria that you've determined in your head or whatever the customer is, uh, who the customer is. So when we take a step back and look at this decision-making um, through the lens of Danny Kahneman, system one, system two, shopping for mixed greens would look a little something like this. If we were to buy in system two, we'd compare all the nutrition facts. We'd look at the, you know, flip over the package, look at the, uh, yeah, the actual facts, which is, you know, almost rare for people to do these days. And then we choose the healthiest option. Then we'd look for the cheapest option of the healthiest. It's just really not how we make choices. Uh, on the left, we have system one. So you might just buy based on habit or routine. Um, the second bullet there is buy based on what other customers buy. So, you know, under, you know, using social influence as a means of, you know, choosing what you want to choose. Uh, that's, you know, very prevalent in the online world, looking at a lot of days now, we just look at reviews as opposed to the product information. Um, based, the third is based on heuristic cues, you know, is there, you know, something you're looking for, organic, natural, you know, non-GMO, whatever the, you know, cue may be for that particular category. The last one is, you know, sometimes you just might not buy the category altogether, too many options. It's certainly a possibility, but that's, you know, something that's very system one. So all these, you know, this gives you a, you know, a little bit of a lens in terms, uh, in terms of the types of processes that are at play when customers are making choices. And obviously this can get much more in depth and detailed depending on the category in which consumers are making decisions. I think one thing worth noting too is, you know, it doesn't matter who you are uh, or what you're researching, these heuristics, these biases, everyone's susceptible to, you know, a lot of um, errors or, you know, making system one decisions, you know, so everyone, everyone that we, that we conduct research on, it's, 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 it's all the same. So whether it's a customer, whether it's B2B, whether it's you know, some financial superstar like Warren Buffett or some CEO of, uh, you know, of some major tech company, a scientist, physician, patient, it doesn't matter who it is. Um, everyone's brain operates similarly in the sense that you know, we're bounded rational. You know, we have system one and system two decisions. So, you know, these are things that we all experience. And, you know, this is why it's relevant universally, no matter what type of research you're doing. So to summarize this section, you know, Adam Smith, rational choice theory, choices maximize utility. You know, Herbert Simon came through and said, that's not the case. We satisfy, we don't look for op look to maximize utility. We want, want good enough decision. And then what Daniel Kahneman came through and you know, a lot of our choices are, are non-conscious. That system one, you know, autopilot, you know, trying to you know, make quick, good enough, but quick decisions. And you know, from our perspective, we wanna understand them. We're gonna pivot now to so what? Um, you know, why does all this matter? So there's been, you know, this is probably the, you know, most um, data intensive slide you'll see in the deck. So just bear with me on this. It's just kind of two uh, correlations uh, between attitudes and intentions and behavior. This comes from Webb and Sharon, where they look at um, the ability of intentions and attitudes to predict behavior 
change. And what this, what the simple story is, is that attitudes and intentions do not, they have a weak correlation with behavior change. And what do, does have a stronger correlation or what explains that variance, um, that 72% is a lot of things outside of people's explicit attitudes and intentions. Our social pressures, emo emotional stress, distractions, choices, habits, biases, heuristics. The point is what someone say doesn't necessarily predict what they potentially do. There's a lot of other things that are important and at play. And as a field of behavioral science, we seek to understand those because those are what empower us to deliver better results for our clients through understanding those dynamics in terms of how decisions are made and how we can better influence them through marketing to impact consumer behavior or patient or physician behavior, whatever that may be. So these percentages, like I said, they're not perfect, but the point is we wanna look at how we can win. A lot of marketing is focused on that, you know, 20% uh, or, you know, where we want to focus on is that kind of that non-conscious, that system one, look at, you know, what are the potential drivers of decision-making that are not being accounted for? And this is ultimately what helps us get a competitive edge in helping our clients un understand something they otherwise would not have. So our summary so far, behavioral science, that's simply the study of decision-making. Decision-making is largely non-conscious. This is a significant and huge opportunity for those in market research as well as marketing. When we, if we understand behavioral science, we can significantly improve our outcomes in marketing and market research. All right, great. We're gonna pivot now to three different ways you could build behavioral science into your research. It's three simple ways. We're gonna go through each of these in turn. The first is optimize your research design. The second is improve your research methodologies. And third is identify research inputs or improve your research inputs. So let's first start um, with research design. So, you know, whenever we do a study with a client, we're always interested, just said my internet is unstable. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that is not the case and that you guys can hear me, see me and see everything that's going on. If not, just ping me and let me know. Um, but um, so the purpose, when we think about behavioral science, uh, behavioral science research design, I think that uh, the way in which we like to think of it is we always have a business question on behalf of our client. Whatever that may be, that might be gross sales, increase uh, profitability, grow our market share, um, <clears throat> you know, increase adoption, whatever it may be of a new product, whatever, whatever the business question. From there, we always develop a research question. And um, that has to lead to a behavior we're interested to produce in order to create that business question. So for instance, if the example is to grow sales, we want to understand um, customer choices. If we want to understand how to increase, you know, the prescription of our, you know, our new, our new drug formula, we have to measure, you know, behavior change in Rx of our brand. The point is we want to connect the dots between a business question, the research question, and the behavior that drives that business question. So, what you know, we, we usually get the business question from the client. They have a uh, an explicit, you know, measurable outcome they're interested in. And for us to achieve that, we need to narrow that down to a behavior that needs to change. And then our research approach is determined by that. So let's just give an example. Um, you know, a lot of the studies we'll do will happen to be, especially quantitative, we'll, we will include an experimental design. That means that we're going to have independent variables and we're going to test them to see what impacts whether we have a behavior change or not. So in many cases, um, we'll develop different interventions, whether that's marketing collateral, um, whether that's 
digital advertisements, whether that's even new products, we always um, will test that vice averse um, different um, different things that we're interested in measuring and always compare that to a control. And then we always measure that relative to an outcome. We wanna see uh, does our independent variable drive a dependent variable. And we'll, if this isn't uh, connecting with you, we'll show you this in an actual practical example later on. But the point is, the reason we like experimental is because we can help isolate what works. Does condition A drive more sales or does you know condition B drive more sales? Does Condition A drive more sales than B and C, but not necessarily more than something I've been using in the past. That's something worth knowing. So these are this is a way for us to isolate. Behavioral science likes to, you know, isolate things to really identify what's working. This is one of the ways in which we do that. In terms of connecting the business goal to behavior, we VC has developed a couple, you know, practical tools to iron this out. And this is something we use with all of our clients just because it's, it's just makes sense. It's easy. It's practical. And it allows us to connect uh, and define our target behavior in a more uh, effective way. And ultimately, it, it always leads to better outcomes. You know, a lot of times I notice, um, you know, people run projects and they just don't have a clearly defined behavioral outcome. And that's, I think, missing the mark for, in terms of, you know, really getting um, in a, you know, a, a very strong result with their, their work because it's too fuzzy, their research project. So let me start on the left. You know, we, we always like to define the target behavior at first. So what this is, is the who, what, when, where, and how often in terms of the behavior you're looking to, to change. You know, in that example, you see in very small print, this is from uh, um, a, a Brita uh, water filter study. We're looking at a certain age group. Um, you know, what was the decision we're looking to change? In this case, it was a client water filter instead of uh, bottled water. You know, when did they need to do it when they were uh, we were looking to change behavior for, you know, multi-pack body bottled water purchasers. Um, you know, where was it? You know, we had specific retailers we had of interest and then how often, you know, so it was just once. So really explicitly defining these things, um, it helps better, uh, you know, really focus what you're trying to achieve and ultimately nets out at a better result. The next thing we always do with our clients is our BZ3Bs framework. And this is really, really simple as well, but you know, and it just, but it just works. So there's no need to really complicate it. We always have a current behavior, right? Whatever we're, we're starting. And then we always have a desired behavior. Between these two are benefits and barriers. Benefits are things that drive that behavior um, or motivational forces. Uh, and then there's things that inhibit that from happening. Um, this is my connections and stable again. Hopefully that's just a little hiccup. But um, when we identify benefits and barriers, we ultimately can drive, uh, we can understand the forces that are gonna create or inhibit the behavior change from happening. It's, you know, it's, it's always good to really be clear on the, uh, the end behavior, but it's also just, if not more important to under, understand what's gonna, what's gonna uh, actually cause that behavior to change and also what's preventing that behavior from changing. So between these two things, we ultimately will identify those forces and, um, and ultimately, um, identify what, what's at play in this behavior change process. Um, next, we have research methodology. So beyond the design, there's things we could do in terms of improving our research methodology. There, you know, there's two ways I like to think about uh, our research methodology. One is, you know, uh, simple survey tactics. So things you could do just to improve the methodological rigor of your survey you're designing, 
Um, a lot, this gets often overlooked. And I find this is just the easiest, biggest opportunity to drive better research results. It's just to reduce some of our researcher biases in, in terms of making our, our, our surveys and questionnaires just more simple, uh, reducing, you know, reducing any um, priming effects any scale effects, um, you know, the length alone of people's surveys, but just not really, you know, anchoring questions correctly. There's just ways, just simple, easy ways to, you know, improve just through um, different simple survey tactics. I have a few scientific articles on these um, that are super helpful. So feel free to ping me after, and I'll be happy to share those. Um, I also I, I have a checklist at some point um, that I could share um, that, you know, just as a helpful guide to go through when you're making uh, surveys just to minimize bias. And, you know, and ultimately that improves the outcomes of the research. The, the next thing on the right are advanced techniques. A lot of folks um, tend to gravitate towards these when they think of behavioral science. But I don't want to diminish the power of just doing the little basic things to improve the research. But the things on the right certainly are very helpful. Indirect measures of behavior. Um, you know, there's a lot of things such as implicit associations, uh, eye tracking, disguised choice techniques, behavioral interviewing, EEG, neuroscience. There's a lot of different tools and um, widgets that are coming out that you know claim they can really unearth that system one. Um, I've certainly at some point used these all um, and I have varying opinions on them, but in certain cases, they work better than others. Um, they're not necessarily a one size fits all. So, but these are the kind of tools we have at our disposal when we're looking to understand customers. So there's a couple I'm going to double click on and just talk a little bit more on. Um, one of them is uh, behavioral choice methodology that we use here at BZ. And one of that, and I'll just give a, just a quick example uh, on why it's so effective, easy to, to implement, and just, um, just a better predictor of behavior. The reason is, you know, it's simply because instead of just asking someone what their attitude and intent is, we look to use you know, a more incentivized behavioral choice. An example I always give people is like, if I, if I were to ask you, would you go to the gym? Everyone's gonna say, yeah, I would love to, or you know, um, yeah, I'm definitely gonna go to the gym. But the thing is, if I instead ask, which would you choose? A 30 day subscription to Netflix or a 30 day pass to, you know, Planet Fitness, Equinox, or some gym of your choice. Um, most people, that's going to be a better predictor of what people do by giving them skin in the game, giving them a choice. That is what we, that's a dependent variable. We ultimately d design studies to create a behavioral choice um, that incentive aligned choice to ultimately better predict what someone's gonna do in the real world. So instead of saying, do you like this? Do you want it? Uh, we, incentivize, we incentivize that choice and actually see what people choose. And ultimately that helps you know, guide um, what cu customers are gonna choose or what patients or physicians are gonna, what choices they're gonna make. These, these are just a better proxy uh, than just asking attitude or intent. The next piece uh, that I have here is research inputs guided by theory. So there's a lot of you know scientific theory that has spun out through the field of behavioral science. The way I like to think of them as a, like a GPS, um, they help us find the most effective and efficient route to get to a destination. So a lot of behavioral scientists have spent decades exploring different ways in which uh, customers and patients make decisions as it relates to a lot of different topics. And what we like to do here at BZ as, when we start any project is do a you know thorough literature review to identify what are the best uh, theories that could help us accelerate a better outcome for our client. 
So, you know, what I did here was just put a couple of them, ones that we kind of use frequently. On the left is this warmth competence uh, theory, which, you know, explains a bit about how people make judgments, um, how they make decisions. And, you know, this can be applied to a lot of different brands. And we actually apply this in the healthcare space as well um, to find out um, uh, which, you know, whether, you know, there's certain um, physicians or patient relationships that are more warm versus competent. Um, and it helps us really segment things and look at ways in a, you know, in a different way that we typically wouldn't look at them. Um, and then, you know, on the right, there's optimal distinctness. This is, you know, a very social psychology related um, theory, which tells a bit about, you know, we use this in the, um, apparel space. Um, this is certainly something that's relevant uh, in terms of fitting in or standing out in terms of how people perceive themselves amongst their social groups. The point is, there's a lot of theories out there uh, and they provide a, a kind of a guiding framework to think about different business problems in question. So we use these um, for different um, yeah, depending on the different studies. And ultimately they help us look at problems in unique ways and help deliver sometimes a competitive advantage for our clients. So talked about three things in this section here. We have research designs. Um, you know, we like to design experimental studies. We like to isolate things. We identify the target behavior for specific research projects. We connect the target behavior with the business goal. We develop our research um, and we identify those benefits and those barriers. What are those driving forces that play a role in how uh, we can change behavior? The second one is research methodology. Talked about two different things. There's simple, easy uh, survey tactics that anyone could, you know, just quickly implement to minimize research bias and improve your research outcome. Advanced techniques, these certainly can be helpful to better predict behavior depending on your research goals, budgets, times, uh, also very good tools. And then lastly, interventions guided by theory. Um, use these to um, advance your research and optimize, you know, different things that, uh, you know, the different marketing ideas and how to make your um, research get more traction. Great, we are pivoting to the last part here, just doing a quick time check. Um, and we're gonna just discuss a few case studies. Uh, we'll first start with this Brita case study. Uh, I kind of was discussing a, a couple of components of it earlier, but you know, what the purpose of this research was, was to get, to change behavior from, um, from consumers who buy plastic bottled water um, and change that over to, uh, to reduce the bottled water consumption and change that over to buying filtered picture, pictures. And as you can imagine, this is quite a behavioral challenge. I think it's, it's actually, it's you know, probably one of the biggest that we've worked on. There's another one that's coming up that's also very behavioral. But you know, if you think about it, water is free in like 99% of households, safe to drink, and yet people are spending money on bottled water. Uh, so it's kind of a hard sell, you know, in this, in this category to shift people around um, when they get some, you know, immediate gratification, just picking up the bottled water, it's cheap. You know, buying a filtered pitcher certainly is a bigger upfront investment. There's a lot of barriers, but what we did, and you know, we were looking for ways to change that. Uh, this is definitely a big challenge, but you know, we went through a you know a process to get to a, a better outcome for our client. And we'll just walk you through that. The first is we did a literature review. As I mentioned, there's always ways where we can uncover some of the you know heuristics and biases, the behavioral science that underpins some of the decision making in the category. Ultimately, we did a workshop. Um, and this is combining some of BZ's behavioral science knowledge with our clients' deep knowledge in the category. And what we do is we come up with ideas for inter interventions. Uh, you know, what, what are the 
behavioral science principles that play a role in this category? And then how do we turn them into interventions that we can actually test to see if it drives the needle in terms of behavior change? And then, you know, once we uh, developed our, you know, and prioritized the behavioral science principles that are most relevant in the marketing intervention, we went to a creative development phase where we developed these interventions. And what these were for this particular test were social ads via Instagram. This was the means in which they were going to be uh, executed in market. So that is how we developed them. And that is also how we tested them. I'm going to walk you through the, uh, the, the research design in a second. I just want to kind of show you the, what the stimuli looked like that we tested. You could obviously tell this is a previous version of the Instagram, current, not the current form. So this is one of, you know, yeah, we, we did the study a few years back. Um, but nonetheless, it's still one of our favorites just because of how uh, seamless it was. Um, so what we do is we try to mimic the way in which it's going to hit the market as best possible. So in this case, the Instagram vehicle was precisely how we delivered this as a test. Uh, we put images in, in the study rele relevant to the behavioral principle, and the language was based on the behavioral principle. In this case, this was uh, a so, uh, social proof kind of um, a social proof intervention. Thousands are ditching thousands are ditching bottled water. It's a you know a, a sign of people leaving something. In other words, we want to convey this this theory in language through this imagery as well as short text. And I'm going to show you how we tested this in a second. But we had several of these that we tested, several different behavioral science principles. This is the research design. This is a quantitative study with pretty, pretty you know, sizable base. Uh, what we did was disguise the instructions. Um, so yeah, all these different blue things are kind of ways in which we infuse behavioral science to make it more of a behavioral test. Um, so we disguised the instructions. We didn't kind of allude to people what the nature of the study was. This can help, you know, uh, yeah, disguise it, makes it just a better result. We also added in um, decoys. So we added in decoy ads. Um, so they didn't just see um, Brita ads. They actually had different decoy ads, um, which, you know, disguises also the nature of the test, as well as doesn't, you know, give away that this is, you know, necessarily for Brita. Um, we had a control to compare to, to have a baseline. And you know we use that incentive aligned choice test to understand skin in the game in terms of what people choose. So instead of asking does someone um, you know like uh, or have positive attitudes or like you know um, choosing filtered water, uh, yeah, we we measured choice as opposed to someone's liking or intention. Um, this was kind of the main dependent variable, and I'm going to show you the result in a second. So there was a, a very conclusive result in this particular study. So for this particular test, you could see here, uh, you know, what these percentages are is this is the percentage choosing bottled water um, subtracted from those percentage choosing filtered water. The takeaway, and you'll see most of these are negative, but um, there was only one that was positive. Um, and, you know, first off, it's worth noting that the, this is, a very tough behavioral challenge. So seeing um, a delta is, you know, very hard uh, to overcome. You know, bottled water is a significant challenge. First off, second, you know, all of our conditions beat the control. So that was definitely a positive. There was one that stood out uh, relative to the others, and you know, this was a very convincing win from a behavioral perspective one actually drives more choice, uh, you know, and it was statistically significant versus the control. So this was certainly the winner uh, from a behavioral perspective. Um, we also, for comparison, asked attitudinally um, about did the post change your mind? And what the major takeaway was is that this type of question 
really had no impact. We could not learn very much at all from asking did you know a very attitudinal based question. So, you know, using you know this was this study was very powerful in you know showcasing the power of using an incentive aligned behavioral choice question. Great, we're going to pivot to the next one here. This was in the motor oil category. Um, like many other categories, this is steeped with a lot of challenges. Um, low involvement, low differentiation, lots of choice and complexity, very hard to make decisions. Um, not to mention, um, this is also a very um, behavioral science question, largely because, you know, first off, DIY, how many people, I mean, there's actually a, a big market of uh, do it yourself, people who change their own motor oil. In New York City, we don't have cars, so I can't really relate. But for those that do have car, cars um, and that change your own oil, it's rather interesting because you can literally change your oil through, um, you know, one of these instant oil changes for relatively cheap. You know, when you think about all the costs associated with doing it yourself, getting the equipment, the time, it's a mess. It's actually kind of dangerous. You have to lift up your car. There's limited rational reasons why consumers do it themselves. But nonetheless, there's a, you know, still a significant chunk of the population. And it's a big business for some of these folks. You know, our client was interested in understanding how they can better drive choice in this category. There's a lot of private label growing. And instead of doing a typical journey, we decide to do an identity-based journey. And this is kind of a, an, another interesting uh, way in which we looked at this process. And this was uncovered through looking in, into the research. We identified that there's a lot, identities, can be used to better predict customer choices. You know, our identities are what influence our choices and our behaviors. So if we can understand them, we can better understand uh, our customers and ultimately market to them to effectively drive the outcomes we're interested in. So, you know, we are, you know, I often say in behavioral science, we're not reinventing the wheel. Like, the wheel is the wheel. What we're trying to do is, you know, make it spin faster and more efficiently. And that's exactly what we did here. Um, so behavioral science doesn't rewrite the journey for how customers are making, you know, decisions um, in terms of the process. You know, everyone has a need, they have a trigger, there's information we, 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 we pull, there's, you know, we obviously make choices. Um, but one of the interesting angles we approached this uh, was through these identity-based motivations and non-conscious drivers of purchase, which ultimately we created these identity profiles. I noticed there's a couple people raising their hands. Feel free to pop in the question. We'll definitely answer them towards, uh, towards the end. We're gonna get there very shortly. Um, <clears throat> so, the reason identities are important because they organize our experience and they help us make better predictions about customers' behaviors. They're kind of, you know, a mind map for a lot of different decisions across a lot of different categories. Uh, so one of the um, examples I often give as it relates to identities is when I initially became a runner, you know, I kind of joined this kind of social group. I had this new identity of a runner. And, you know, with an, an identity as a runner, there's certain things that come along with that identity. So obviously you get the right footwear. You know, I think this is probably the one of the most startling things is, you know, was when I transitioned to wearing shorter shorts. Um, that is certainly um, a thing that's associated with that runner identity. I, you know, I would never have said I would have worn short shorts, but I realize there's a performance benefit. It's what all runners do. So there's an identity characteristic to it. And another thing I realized when I first started running was you don't wear the Apple watch, you wear the Garmin watch. You know, you need a real runner running watch. Next is you shop at certain retailers. And lastly, there's, you know, different places where you run. That's where runners run. You know, Central Park is the prime spot in New York City. So the key is, the takeaway is, you know, identities 
can help us really understand customers. They tell us a lot. Uh, just by understanding the identity, we can understand how these decisions can be made. <clears throat> so when it comes to you know, using the behavioral science literature, we always look to it in terms of ways in which we can understand our customers. As it relates to identities, there's five identities. There's been a lot of extensive research, uh, worked quite a bit with Juliana Loran in terms of um, you know, developing a, the tool that's used in behavioral science and applying it in the context of our market researchers for this DIY customer base. So there's there's five different identities, and you know we can we apply this across different categories, and uh, it helps us get a different perspective to understand um, how a customer may be making decisions in that particular category. So what we do is we adapt this tool and to really understand the DIYers. So, you know, this is kind of what the five DIYer identities look like. There's verifiers. These people change their oil uh, <clears throat> because they like to take care of things. They say they know what they're doing. This is a typical DIYer. We have the avoiders. They, these are people who are avoiding a certain image as opposed to verifying their image. They don't want to be seen as lazy. We have dependents. These are people who, uh, they establish independence by changing their own oil. They get a sense of independence through doing that. They have vis there's a visuals. Uh, these are people who are exposed to information about changing one's own oil. So they're, they're very influenced by things they see. And then there's people uh, that are, we call socials. They change their oil based on, you know, associations in their network who do it. Uh, <clears throat> the point is there's different percentages within a customer population in, in our target population that make up each of these. And we wanted to identify what they are, measure that and identify that. One of the things we realized, or, you know, what we came to was a very, um, a very simple DIY journey that had kind of two kind of path where we uh, collapsed uh, two identities um, up at the top. So these are people who re reinforce, needed to uh, reinforce their identity. And the go goal was to speed up that DIY process, help them make a more efficient decision, get them to the right store for the product, uh, the right store for the product and benefits they're needing. And then there's another, uh, the other group where the dependents, visuals and socials along the bottom, these, um, needed their identity confirmed. So, and there was a lot more of a process for this group. So the way in which we market to them is gonna be, uh, you know, more focused on the brand. Uh, and, you know, this ultimately helped shape how they segmented customers and ultimately marketed to them. There's ultimately a, a, a bigger piece to that, a second piece where we identified heuristic cues that go on the pack that would ultimately drive that would influence and impact decisions for these two groups. But um, not enough time to go through that. Um, I actually am conscious of time. Um, we have 10 minutes left. Um, I wanted to see if people have questions. I want to address questions. If there's not questions, I'll, I'm gonna, you know, I'll definitely just um, roll through this last case study. Um, someone asked, is this a persona? Um, so these are not necessarily personas. These are, you know, so what we measured in that study were identities. There's five identities. Um, they are uh, mutually exclusive. In other words, you fall into one of the buckets and we measured them amongst that particular population uh, of interest to ultimately see what are, what the differences were and how we can better come up with an angle to market to our customers. So the identity was a, a more optimal way to view the DIY customer base, largely because there's a lot of identity associated steeped in that category for folks that change their own oil. Another, uh, another type, yeah, so someone said, you know, it's, it's another type of segmentation approach. You know, that's a really good point. It kind of is. It allows us a different way to, you know, to group people. Um, 
is it a, this was not necessarily a segmentation per se, but it, it somewhat is in some sense. So it's ultimately a different way to look at customers um, and market to them, you know, effectively group them. Very good point. In the next few minutes, I'm just gonna go through the last couple, uh, this last case study. So this, uh, our client here was a pioneer of the allergy introduction um, supplement for infants. You know, I didn't actually, when I first learned this, I had no idea what it was. Um, but um, now it's actually more relevant because I have a baby on the way, but it's um, allergy introduction supplement is you introduce allergies to infants at a very young age. And later in life, they do not develop allergies, food allergies. Very uh, interesting um, category. And um, what our client was interested in, this is a very new to market, wasn't on, in retail yet. So they're looking how to maximize the benefits, maximize choice and do it at the highest price. Um, it's just, they were kind of exploring what are the different areas that this could be put in retail. You know, how, and this is challenging largely because people don't know what this is. And it, although it comes in the same form factors, it comes in, you know, um, it comes in, you know, puffs, it comes in a formula mix, a mix in, um, and then it also comes in a cracker uh, <clears throat> as well. But, so it's kind of disguised in normal, uh, you know, food for infants, but it comes with this premium benefit of hel helping reduce the incidence of developing a food allergy later in life. Um, so we had to find and test to see where this would do best in retail. And we measured it across different contexts. And so to show how we do this, we test it and we mock up different shelf contexts. This is critical, you know, because we wanna understand what's gonna be most receptive where is this going to do best on shelf? So what we do is we put it in these different contexts. We mock them up. Um, we develop a limited shelf set with the competitive products for that category. So for baby food, we have the baby food products. What also is important, we had the price points. Decisions are made relative to context. So we try to replicate the context the best we can. Um, and we do this through an online environment to optimize, you know, the scale at which we can test this. So we in, put the client's products in three different shelf contexts with price points. And ultimately what we measured was, you know, that behavioral choice. I actually don't have the uh, results slide in this, but what we found was the, um, the, the supplement was the winner in terms of the most uh, where we can command the largest choice as well as at the highest price point. This is, you know, interesting because each context tells a different, it tells, it ha each context has a different association with what that product meant in that category. So in the food context, the price points are low. In terms of the supplements, the price points high. Um, and so it changes how customers think about a product. And we all we do do test this a lot with a lot of clients, how we can move uh, a potential product into a different category uh, on, in their shelf set and see how we can command a premium or even drive more choice. We have to test this to ultimately see what is gonna drop, how, how that potentially works. And this is the way in which we do it. We put it in a shelf set and then we use the behavioral choice. Uh, one of the other interesting things about this study and we'll close up with this, is we did some implicit testing where we um, not only had the pack size, we had a pack size and price. So it's quantity and price. And you know we wanted to look at ways in which <clears throat> consumers ass assign value to different um, you know, pack size as well as price point. And we tested different ways of framing this. This was super interesting Dif by different days, verse seven days versus one week, verse five count. Um, and you know, we actually had the pack, so you had a visual, but you could see the different, um, you know, the different quantities written as shown here on this slide. And what we what we concluded was that you know, we found a way to you know, deliver a higher 
perceived value by framing the pack size, you know, from seven to 10. Uh, this was an interesting anomaly in terms of how customers made quick decisions in terms of ascribing value to a product. So this is rather a very interesting insight that came from this study. And ultimately we do do test this a lot of different ways in terms of associations and value and ultimately how we can, you know, better, um, you know, deliver a perceived value for the customer base. So I'm just going to end there. Um, we have a, our, our, our summary for today, you know, consumers don't buy purely based on rational choices. They, you know, they make heuristic quick decisions using their system one. You know, we went through a lot of different topics and uh, in terms of research design, um, as well as, you know, ways in which you can optimize your research design with the three Bs, um, identifying the target behavior, different ways to improve your methods and questions, design inputs based on behavioral science. And then also we walked through a few different case studies. Um, lot, lot, lot to unpack today. Definitely appreciate you guys coming. If you guys have any questions, my email's on the right. My phone number's there for you. Feel free to um, hit me up with an email if you have any questions. Happy to share or have a discussion with you. Um, just to kind of leave on a note where we operate, we do, BZ does operate in the healthcare as well as the consumer space. We do do a number of different types of testing from segmentation, omni-channel, innovation, message testing, even premiumization, as well as uh, <clears throat> a lot of health healthcare physician patient decision-making. Thank you guys for taking the time out of your day. Appreciate it. Hope you guys learned something. Um, definitely feel free to hit me up if you have any questions. Thanks again.